Upstairs at Freylux, show 309, real one. Hey, Wendy. Yeah? Stan says you're a cunt. You're a cunt. Stan says you're a cunt. Cunt. Well, tell Stan to cunt. Off. You're a cunt continuing source of inspiration to him. I mentioned in the last episode that we were watching the Batman movies. <clears throat> and we finally finished up with, uh, well, Batman the Killing Joke, which was absolutely incredible. It was really, really good. This, The Killing Joke is what I always wanted uh, a Batman movie to be. I wanted it to have that that level of a kind of reality, but also be incredibly dark and also really embrace the whole graphic novel thing, which is what it was. It was based on Alan Moore. But before that, we watched Batman and Robin. And I guess I have to agree with you. If I thought Batman Forever was ridiculous... Batman and Robin really took the cake. It was really Batman bad. and Robin it was takes really the fucking bad. taco. That movie takes the fucking taco. And it was so that, I mean, it was, it was so expensive. And it was the first Batman movie to actually lose money. So it was not this enormous hit that they were hoping it would be. And it's no. because I think Schumacher was like, Well, they really liked me camping it up, so I'm just gonna go I'm gonna crank it up to eleven this go round. And it's just you can you can definitely see where the series loses its way. And it is Schumacher's partially his production design and how he makes a movie like this. And I said, you know, Schumacher's a director I don't hate. You know, I really, you know, I enjoy a lot of his work. The Falling Down is probably my favorite movie that he directed. I like his Grisham adaptations. His Grisham books, uh, the the movie The Client and Time to Kill are both very good too. But Falling Down for me is personally the one that I really... There's also uh, a DC lo- cab. You can't, lo- you can't Lost Boys. Lost Boys. Not, not, not the biggest fan of Lost Boys. <laughs> Oh, Watch. whatever. You you see, that's what's sad. You grew up in that area. You were 15 when that came out. You should have been Gaga for that. I was I, five. Well, you know, I mean, Fright Night is my movie. You know, there are two camps. Fright Nights, there's Fright, Fright, Fright Night Nights and there's in, Lost Boys. Ah, uh, but then you're in my camp. I'm in the Near Dark camp. Near Dark also. Well, it's a different... Well, Near Dark is a different uh, kind of a movie because it's not really about, like... It's not about... It's not focused on teenagers. It's focused on, you know, character actors from Jim Cameron movies, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. But it's cool how they treat vampirism as a disease that can actually be cured. Yeah, yeah. I need. I mean, it's a, li- a, it's a little, um, it's, it's a little ham-fisted, you know, with the whole blood transfusion thing. I think but... we, you and I should do a Catherine Bigelow night, and we should do Near Dark, and we should do um, uh, Strange Days. That would be a good one to match up yes. with. Strange Days is another movie I don't want to really much care for, but there, there's a Jim Cameron connection in both movies. But for tonight, uh yes, Batman and Robin was terrible. <laughs> it was absolutely terrible. I can't really I can't put the fault on George Clooney though. I think he George Clooney did a great job. I thought he was fine. My problem was mainly uh Alicia Silverstone and Uma Yeah, Thurman. Alicia Alicia No, Uma Thurman I like a lot because she knew what she was doing. She just hammed it up. She and hammed she, just, it, she was trying to do a Mae West impersonation, but there's so many stupid puns. I was counting all the puns. The but movie. that's the it whole thing. Either. It's like okay, you can admire it for trying to be like pretty much a live action cartoon, but at the same time, that's its downfall. And, and that's interesting too, because we're going to talk about two movies that get it right. They get it right, but they're at complete opposite ends of the spectrum. And we're talking about Shazam and, and Joker, two DC movies based on comic books that were released in 2019. The earlier one being Shazam from March, and I think Joker was released on my birthday in 2019, October 4th. For all you data harvesters out there, yes, I'm a Libra. Um, (laughs) But uh, Shazam is a movie that by all rights should not be good, but it is really actually very good. It has its its problems, but but it's a much better movie than Batman and Robin. (laughs) I think Shazam is probably the most Marvel feeling movie out of any of the DC movies. Oh, it definitely has that kind of side side grin, um, snarky attitude and fast humor that Marvel movies have. Yes, definitely. They're obviously because trying they to tried this. they tried that with Justice League. Joss Whedon tried doing that with Justice League and it failed. Well, Ju- Justice League has this real problem with it. The same problem that the Superman movie uh, Man of Steel had. They're unwatchable. The Justice League and uh, Man of Steel were unwatchable because, and also I think maybe even the first Wonder Woman, these these effects that they were using for me were giving me a headache. You know, and maybe they improved on the technology because Shazam looks fantastic. Shazam looks great. Wonder now Wonder Woman. I have no problems with Wonder Woman eighty four. Those effects are kind of hammy. They're pretty bad. 
Um, I have yet to see that. At the same, at the, at the same time, it. Wonder Woman 84 is like super fucking meta. So it's kind of like you either love it or you hate it. I hear like, that there's a lot of like, like kind of like there's a like a Trump character and there's a very anti-Trump feel. Well, to the yeah, thing. yeah. Like you, you I don't can, think you should be mixing politics that soon. Yeah, that, they, they mix you know. the politics a little bit too much for it. But like Shazam, it's it is literally one of the most straightforward, simplest DC comic book movies you could ever do. And they actually got it right. Yeah, I, I was frankly surprised and I was surprised because uh, the cast, you know, for me. I didn't know who any of these people except for Give Us Us Free, Jimon, who I uh, got, it's hard to pronounce his name. Jaiman Hunsu. Jaiman Hunsu. Jaiman Hunsu. Okay. You you made that sound so easy. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to. Because I've actually liked him since before he got famous because he did a, his breakout role was Amistad. Yeah. But so like he d- that's why I always call him Give Us Us Free. He did a little <laughs> movie that I fucking love called deep rising and he was one of the standouts in that movie deep rising that was was that the one with treat williams and pump johnson yes and it was done i by saw Steven that Summers, in the movie theater. The, i'm lucky you i wish i, I could. actually I had to wait saw for that vhs i think it might have been one of the last movies we saw at this movie theater before it closed down it was a united artist movie theater with sticky floors smelled of god knows what and uh we used to go there i think tickets were like seven bucks but yeah jaiman hunsu in that movie he was hit his english is really good like you can tell it's like, yes, he's this big African actor, but like in Amistad, he really amped up his accent. But like in in uh, Deep Rising, his accent, like he has one, but it's nowhere near as thick as it was in Amistad. I don't I don't always confuse him with this other guy, Adeli Wakumbo or whatever his name is, the guy who. Oh, but uh, but the thing with Adeli, he's like he's your he's British. Right. But another kind of like formidable African presence. Right, because he was in, I remember him too. He got, you see, everyone, you're talking about these great actors. He got, I remember him from Ace Ventura and Nature Calls. Oh, really? <laughs> Boy, that's that how I coming. remembered it. That's how I remembered him the first time I saw him, because he played that guard, E2. Right. I mean, it, it was a, it's a bit part, but it's funny. It was a funny role. It's, uh, okay, so, so this, the, it, like I said, there's a lot of silly stuff in this, because it's obviously meant to be played for humor. Um, but, but it's basically about this uh, kid gets into a uh, traffic accident or whatever, and uh, and then he goes into this temple. It's, it has a very Harry Potter vibe to it. It kind of reminds me of Harry Potter with the Council, Council of Wizards and all that stuff. And then you have your your bad guys and this guy, um, Thaddeus, who's played by Mark Strong, who we never... I The thing about Mark Strong, it's it, he seemed familiar to me, but I didn't know who he was, and then suddenly he pops up in every movie I'm watching now. Well, yeah, wasn't he in a bunch of Guy Ritchie? He was in some Guy Ritchie movies. I know that, he was yeah, in, uh... that was probably his start because he is a British actor. But we saw him recently in uh, what is it that we were watching that we saw him in recently? Oh, it was nineteen seventeen. Okay, well, you saw that. I didn't. And he was in something. He was in a TV show recently that we just watched. He's he's a he's a really good he's a really good uh, bad guy in this movie. He does a fine job. For the for the inverse of that, you have Zachary Levi playing the grown up version of this kid who they can't figure out what to call him. And they keep coming up with names. There's a lot of really fun montages. But basically what happens is you have this uh, we flash forward into the future in Philadelphia. And by the way, this is movie Philadelphia. Philadelphia does not actually look like this. They got the skyline and everything, but it's a much filthier town. And they do not have some freaking Santa Claus Christmas carnival going on or winter carnival. Yeah, it's not Philly. Philly was a city. I grew up in Philly and um, I loved it because I grew up. I went back there and the whole city changed. I mean, it just became terrible. It really became a bad, bad city. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, we're talking Detroit squared here. Uh, Jeez, then no, it got that bad. It got really bad. Yeah. So there was this kid who apparently disappeared uh, uh, and his mother couldn't find him or something. And he became a foster kid and he goes into and out of foster homes and he finally gets settled into this uh, final foster home, which is this enormous house uh, with this very friendly, I mean, okay, this movie is fantasy. I just want to point that out. This is fantasy because things like this, situations like this don't actually happen in real life. He winds up in this wonderful foster family with all these other kids who are foster kids run by these two very lovely uh, people who I guess, you know, take they in. were foster They were foster kids at one point in time, yeah. too. But don't don't even pretend they're not getting a shitload of money from the state for, for doing this. That I just want to point that out. 
and there's the there's all these wonderful kids. It's all international. It's a multicultural. It's a Benetton ad under one roof. They all seem to like him. He wants to get out because he's kind of like a hacker, if you will. He's like a John Connor, if you will, like an Eddie Furlong. And he's <laughs> there's like this really actually it's kind of a stupid scene when you think about it, but it's it's funny in the context of how it works in the movie. He makes it look as though this pawn shop's been robbed. The cops show up, and and he, he manages to imprison them behind a gate or something and just to get into their car and use their cop computer to track down addresses because he's been searching for his mother this whole time. And I'm like, this is a really roundabout way to get access to a cop computer. But I understand it's really exciting for the movie, but all he would have to do is kind of like bluff his way into headquarters or something and maybe get quick access to a computer or something along those lines. I feel like the writers didn't want to take that road. They wanted to get you know, the path of least resistance. So he grabs a collection of names and he's still, and he's getting into trouble. And also he's got bullies and, and well, his friend, he kind of makes friends with this kid, uh, uh, Freddie and, um, which is his, uh, his, uh, foster brother. Yeah. He's the one, he's got braces, right? Yes. He's, he's a, he's handy capable as you might, you might call him at the risk of sounding trite. I'm not going to say it, but you know, you know what I want to say. What gimp? Timmy. Oh, Timmy. Well, he's not exactly Timmy. It's kind of funny. I was making a Timmy joke. No, I was making... Who's the other one? Jimmy? Jimmy is the other one? Jimmy! Right, there's Jimmy. And there was a line in South Park where Stan wanted to send a message to um, to Wendy. And he says, tell Wendy, mm. tell, tell Wendy I'm a con- she's a continuing source of inspiration for me. And he keeps stuttering. And he says, he says Wendy, uh, Stan says you're a cunt. Stan says you're a cunt. He says you're a cunt. He says you're a cunt, and she walks off. And says, <laughs> continuing uh, source of inspiration for. Her. So it was like Stan says you're a cunt over and over again. But they let that on TV. I was telling that joke to somebody earlier. I forget who that was. I think it might have been my daughter. I will say this about the movie though. While we get into it, Zachary Levi was the perfect casting choice for this movie because, like, when I first heard that he was going to be Shazam, and I first saw the trailer, I'm like. Oh my God! You got the right fucking guy. <laughs> Maybe I'm an old man, but I don't remember him from anything. I don't remember seeing Chuck. him in anything. Chuck. He was on a show called Chuck. And if you didn't watch Chuck, I feel sorry for you. That show was so fucking great. I, I it was didn't. just uh, it was so great. It was on the wrong fucking network. Well, what what years are we talking about? Was it on? Oh, Chuck was on from like 2009, 2008. It had a good four or five year run. You know, I was raising my daughter. We were moving. So I Dude, there is there is this great episode in the first season, me being a diehard Rush fan. It was so great. Basically, Chuck has to defuse a bomb from a fucking missile command machine. OK. And the algorithm to de- to beat missile command is in sync with Rush's Tom Sawyer. Oh, OK. And it was just one of the most epic fucking things. I ever. figured, yeah, that sounds yeah. like something you would appreciate most. Definitely. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. That that his character. It's actually that Tom Sawyer. So... If we break down yeah. Tom Sawyer to its basic component, it's an algorithm. Yes. Well, it sort it's of makes al- sense because because Rush songs do sound like that anyway. They're very it's an algorithm to defeat Missile Command. That's what's the best part of it. So, but anyway, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're oh, a big okay. fan how, of Chuck, how... if you're a big fan of Chuck, you know, like that's why he was such a great a great. Cat, casting per all right a so great person for this how can you lead how do we lead into this in the into the council of wizards where this kid winds up going he, and then uh what's his name give us us free shows up tells him something about how he has to become this this character basically the wizard is shazam like he's just the wizard and he has to find someone who's worthy of carrying on that's mark strong's the first character he tries right and he's not worthy but then he brings in frickin' Shazam's character. Or what, well, what, was his, what was his name? Billy. Billy. Brings in Billy and basically gets him on a last-ditch effort and says, you're not perfect, but you'll do. You'll do. Yeah, you're so not perfect, but you'll do. So it's not quite the chosen one, not quite Harry Potter. He's not quite, but then it and all because... works out. It all works out in the end. And but But also, I have to point out, because he's a straight white male, or appears to be, he can be an unending source of amusement and humor because we can make fun of him in this thing. He may be a superhero, but he's kind of a moron, which it's is just like the best the best way the critics described it. It's literally a superhero version of big. Yeah, it is. It is. It does remind because we were talking about big a little bit in, in while we were watching the movie. But there, I did have a question. There seems to be I, I don't understand why Billy is so smart when he's a 14 year old. But when he's an adult, he's an idiot. 
I mean, but, but, you know what? Yeah, you're right. That that's a little. I get what you're saying, and that is one of the weaknesses. Like, okay, that's why certain body switch movies work well. Like, you take Vice Versa. Like, Fred, that that was perfect casting because, like, you see how Fred Savage acts, and then when Judge Reinhold becomes Fred Savage, they act the same. Yeah. But then the the kid Billy in Shazam, when he becomes Shazam, he acts nothing like his child counterpart. He right. acts so fish out of watery. Right. And then the um, the only other problem I had with the movie is when we get to the final, when we get to the climax of the Winter Carnival, and then suddenly the kids, the other kids, his foster brothers and sisters, become superheroes too. I thought that was a bit much for the ending. I thought, well, I don't. If think you that wanted to, much, I, if we I, have I, a franchise, yes. you could do that in the second movie, maybe. But that's the whole point. They're going to go with that in the second movie. They are going to do a second movie. It's already been confirmed. Or maybe they could do one, two, three, four, five movies. And have all of these kids become and turn into a superhero in each movie. You know how you kind of introduce Bat, you, you introduce Robin and Batman and Robin, or rather in Batman Forever. But then you introduce Batgirl and Batman and Robin. So you go on like that. Maybe that's what they were hoping to do with the the Batman franchise. But then you know it was totally destroyed by that point, and then rebooted anyway by Christopher Nolan. But you usually add characters in. But they sort of they made they made a big a really. Kind of a too big of an ending, really, when you think about it. You you would say the ending is very ambitious, but at the same time, you see, it didn't bother me because I really like where they went with how his foster brothers and sisters ended up becoming, you know, the other members of the crew. Yeah, but the other the the thing I really enjoyed about the movie is that it may it may have this kind of like optimistic feel to it, um, mm-hmm. but it's it kind of hits you in the head with a lot of really painful realities like for instance i i was i was mulling over my head you know what if he didn't run away what if she abandoned him and it actually turned out to be true the mom actually abandoned her own child and i was thinking yeah and that's kind of yeah it shows how that's a real kick in the nuts emotionally and it actually shows the distorted views like you see his view of when he was at the carnival and he thought his mom was all happy and then you look at it from her viewpoint and she was just context. Like, yes. Just like when yeah. remember when we talked about the conversation about how how the 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 uh, the way you say certain words can change the right. meaning completely. This is sort of the way you see things. You're looking at it from your point of view and then there's somebody else who's looking at it from their point of view. We get into this conversation with Mark. Mark Strong has the seven deadly sins, the seven deadly dwarves, as I call them. <laughs> <laughs> the seven, the seven, let me see there's a wrath lust vengeance sneezy dopey and doc no yeah, those pretty. are the seven deadly dwarves <laughs> which should be a movie right there that should be a movie you know marvel presents the seven deadly dwarves actually you know Luck- be a luckily movie. you see dc has always had this vil- they've always had a villain problem like uh uh, they just had this villain problem. I like the villain. I like where they, they went don't, with. You know what? DC had, I mean, like, uh, this, is, this is a topic worthy of another podcast, a completely different one. But I think DC's problem is they did not have the business plan that Marvel had. Marvel had this enormous business plan that started with Iron Man. And it's so it was so brilliant the way it all kind of unfolded, you know? And the way, yeah, they, I mean, the way they ran it together, they had people clamoring to see the next movie. That's why these movies always succeeded, because they would give you a little taste of what you were going to see next, you know? DC doesn't they, have and, that. Well, DC tried that with Man of Steel, but then Man of Steel was, like, so middle of the road. Like, it was, again, that was a middle of the road movie. It wasn't a good jump off point. And then you jump right into Batman versus Superman. And then that ends up being a total disappointment. And then that goes into Wonder Woman, which kind of leads into Justice League, right? Well, yeah. And but the thing, no. Then after that, it goes into Suicide Squad. You've got three oh, disappointing. Yeah, I have. You've yet got to three see... disappointing movies in a row. Three fucking disappointing movies in a row. And you have Suicide Squad leads into Harley Quinn. It sort of starts to splinter out. You know. You see, but luckily, but it's, un- after, it's uninteresting after... to me. I find that uninteresting. What's that? Like I, their... I found all those characters to be uninteresting. I mean, to me, they seemed like. Even even though DC was around much earlier than Marvel, actually, the characters kind of play as pastiches or or, or knockoffs of Marvel characters. You know, mm-hmm. that's the way I see it. I mean, DC tried. I mean, so far the ship is pretty much righted. I mean, they've they figured out where they need to be. Most of their Wonder Woman eighty four, it's still it still made its money on demand despite a Corona. You know, all the other movies, Aquaman was successful. You know, freaking. Birds of Prey did good business, but it the R rating hampered it 
a little bit. A lot, well, a lot of people. But even were still then, I mean, these, these R-rated movies aren't really R-rated per se. They're just sort of like heavy PG thirteens. Well, but then Birds of Prey deserves its R rating because that movie was like a hard R if I've ever seen yeah, think, it. So I mean, I think um, they need to maybe consider expanding. You know, you know how like there's a Deadpool, right? Right. Uh, there should be a Deadpool for DC. Well, that was, I think that was their thing with Harley Quinn. They were trying to get their own Deadpool, but unfortunately, Harley Quinn doesn't carry the same they're levity not, as Deadpool. They're not going to have, I mean, even this, uh, even DC's hits, quote unquote, are nowhere near the successes of Marvel movies. Even like the worst performing Marvel movies tend to do better. What, what was uh, Ant-Man is the one I can think of. Ant-Man and Shazam have a lot in common in that way, but Ant-Man made more money. And the sequel made more money. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's the way they, they, they've integrated. They, it's all one story. Okay. The whole thing with the Marvel movies is it's all one story. It's just been splintered off into different things. And it all and comes that, back and, to and, the but, Infinity Stones. And then DC tried doing the same thing, but they didn't succeed. Like they tried, you know, doing what Marvel did first, get your couple of character movies out of the way and then you do your big team up and then yeah. we go from there well they tried they failed and now they're trying to write the ship and they're just focusing on character movies they did okay. which i'm what, what i'm fine with that yeah uh what they need to do i mean shazam does it right because there's only one fleeting glimpse of superman right and right it's only from the neck down basically they're not within a dc universe this this could be its own separate story uh, there is there is reference to Superman and Batman, but I think maybe DC what needs DC actually needs to do is to completely reboot, start over, come up with a bigger plan, tell that bigger well, story. They, well, they they did that. They did that after Justice League bomb. They complete they everybody got fired after that. They were just like, okay, we need a new plan. And then that's when Shazam, Wonder Woman eighty four, Birds of Prey, Aquaman, like that's where their new plan kicked in, and their new plan is working. Because now all these movies are making money and the critics are liking them. They need to get that Marvel guy. Who is that Marvel guy who's running the Kevin show? Fe Kevin, Kevin Feige. Kevin, Kevin Feige. They need to get him in. But, but here's <laughs> the thing, though. They, are, they already got a Marvel guy. They already got not only a Marvel guy, but they got one of the Marvel guys. They got James Gunn, who's doing the new Suicide Squad. Oh, that's, I suppose that's a good, what, that's a good thing. Well, di uh, dude, that's going to be like what's, what the original Suicide Squad should have been. A fucking balls-to-the-wall action fest, rated R body parts flying fucking bad language everywhere I think that's, the I, kind that's of movie exactly we what i think we're gonna and we're gonna talk about joker soon this is exactly where dc needs to go they need to go adult they need and to that's why they and that's why they hired joker James proved Gunn. joker proved you can get people to come see an r-rated movie well no 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 that's not true no the uh, deadpool kicked that one off first well deadpool deadpool was but Deadpool, but did Deadpool not have, was like this well, was. Actually, I mean, Joker well, was a very dark film. It was seventies dark. That's how dark it was. That's why I really liked it a lot too. But then you could also say Logan is part of that. Too, Logan too. Logan. 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 Yeah, and that's. But I don't know that Logan was that dark though. But then also you could say Blade, the the Blade trilogy. Those are all. Oh, well, Blade. Yeah, but that, that was sort of an alternative nineties approach to comic book movies. It was. It was. Uh, Blade had a Blade is another one. Oh man, I really enjoyed Blade watching it. But that wasn't like you part of your like your your standard Marvel. Movie. But I but I get what you're saying on Joker though. It was a very serious R-rated movie. Yeah, yeah. But let's finish up very Shazam. Um, how it ends? We have Mark Strong and we have the Seven Deadly Dwarves, like I mentioned before before we went off. Uh, and he had his own personal powers there, and oh, really good effects too. Really fantastic uh, visual effects. And then we have that big climax at the carnival and uh, all the bullies to get their lives saved. The jerks. I hate those guys. I can't believe it. But but, you know, we have to be a good guy for this. So let's save them. We get the uh, what? What is this called? The eye. The eye. Yeah. Oh, OK. I remember the eye. Right. It was actually in Mark Strong. Oh, you see, I wish I remembered that part of the end. Uh, I ain't going to lie. I, saw, I haven't watched Shazam in a few, in a few months, but I had to rewatch Joker just so I could talk about that. But I forgot how they got it out of him. Oh, they just they just yanked it right out of his head. Yeah, they, I mean, because it was just in him, and they had to get it out of him because they didn't want to kill him. Because that's where all the creatures were hiding was inside that eye. So yeah, they, they took were all it out, hiding inside of him. Then yeah. all the creatures went back in, and they brought the eye back to the Council of Wizards area, that whole underground area. And then they say, hey, well, you know, this will be our lair. You know, because the whole thing is conscious. The, the movie 
Shazam is a very conscious movie. It's conscious of superheroes, makes a big deal about powers and possible vulnerabilities. You know, it has a bit of unbreakable in it, in its blood. And um, they kind of break down and deconstruct um, uh, comic book superheroes in a way that Deadpool does, too. I mean, even though I know you're saying this movie still does take place within the DCEU because Batman and Superman, because you got to remember the events of Justice League have happened. Yeah. In, in this movie. But they don't make a happened. big deal about it, though. Well, they don't. And because, again, this is Warner trying to brush it under the rug because now they've got the Snyder Cut coming out and they're going to try to get the Snyder Cut to be canon with everything else. They They literally want to brush the old Justice League under the rug and say, we're sorry. We fucked up. Okay. We're going to correct it, and then we don't want to hear it no more. So, so you had placed both Shazam and Joker in your best films of 2019? Yes, because... I don't know if I can put Shazam there, but I really enjoyed no, it. No, I, I took Shazam off because I saw a Parasite, and Parasite had to go like higher up, and Shazam had to go down the yeah. tubes. But Joker, I, uh, I have to completely agree with you. Joker knocked me on my ass. I was not expecting it to be that good. Neither was I. I, I expected the absolute worst out of that movie, not because I didn't want to... I thought this movie was going to be a gigantic Scorsese ripoff, and that Joaquin Phoenix was going to piss me off for two hours. Yeah, that's that's what I thought, too. We might as well get into it now. Joker 2019, of course, released on my birthday. And uh, this. OK, now the whole thing about this, this isn't canon, is it? This is not part of. No, this has this is not. This is Arthur Fleck, who is a, a, a stand up comedian. Joker, uh, from what I understood uh, back in the day, was I forget what a, who was it? Joe Chill, I think. Well, no, they never actually, I never thought they gave a name to who he was. Joe Chill was the one who, who if you're killed, going Batman. If, who killed if Bruce you're Wayne's Batman, parents. Right, and that's Batman year one. And Bruce and, uh, what is it, Joe Chill was part of the Marconi crime family. Right, and the Marconis, uh, according at least to at least to uh, the killing joke, hired the Joker to be their patsy, basically. And mm. he was like in a, um, like a, uh, he, wor he worked for a uh, chemical plant. And um, that's where he gets his origin story, at least in The Killing Joke. And then, of course, in the Tim Burton one, they just mixed everything up. And he was just a, a, a low level criminal named Jack Napier who. who yeah, it was all, am game. that was all amalgamated. That was all amalgamated. So it was all, but whatever it had to do, it had to connect the Joker character to Batman. In that, you know, that I think that was the whole thing that Sam Hamm was going for when he wrote the original script was that he wanted there be, to be a kind of symbiosis between them in that Batman created the Joker and the Joker created Batman. That's what they were going for there. And it was a very satisfying narrative in that. That was 1989. That was when people weren't as psychotic as they are now when it comes to comic books. But then it comes full circle with this movie because depending on how your interpretation, you could honestly say that Thomas Wayne was responsible for creating the Joker. Yes, Thomas, yes. And the Thomas way Thomas Wayne, Wayne was, is depicted in this movie, he's depicted as a real scumbag. Good. It's it's realistic. Yeah, he it, wasn't it like the saintly figure that everybody worshipped and who was a benefactor and a benefic and a and a and a guardian angel for the ten for the city of Gotham, you know, he was a, a, a prick. He was Brett Cullen in this. Brett Cullen from uh, Lost is in this. And also, I believe he played Thomas Wayne or something along those lines in the Batwoman series for for the WB or I'm sorry, for the CW. Jeez, I'm dating myself. It's some kind of connection between Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne, and then this this uh, stupid girl. And it was such a stupid show. God, I had to review the pilot for Second Union. I really disliked it intensely. Haven't watched it. Have no plans. This was like at the end. Fox uh, was showing the Gotham show, which I did enjoy. I did enjoy Gotham for the five years that it was on the air. It was sort of a combination of that kind of campy but scary thing. Right. It was very comic booky, but I really liked the cast and I liked what they did with it. But then after that, I guess the rights reverted and the CW started producing DC stuff. Yeah, because I think, yeah, the CW became home to everything. And then now you've got the DC. Uh, well, the DC shit that's on HBO Max now. Yeah, yeah. So, but this this is like completely organic. This is different. This is something. It's like, what if we take the Joker and make it this instead? And it was very fearless. I'm so surprised that Todd Phillips went and produced this. Oh yeah, this is the, like this coming from the guy who made the fucking Hangover. The Hangover made with old, Bradley Cooper. Old, Bradley Cooper co-produced this yeah. movie too. Old school road trip. Yeah, all those kind of like mindless comedies that they show on TBS constantly. Right, and then he totally reinvents himself. It's just like I don't know how he want how he manages it, but he gets this effect. But but you know, but you know what? It's proof in Hollywood that it can be done. All I need to do is say say 
Two names to you. Number one is Peter Jackson. Number two is Sam Raimi. Right. Look, look where they started and look where they are now. Now, and I, I, I want to say that this movie was made for me. <laughs> it was made for me specifically. It's like proof we're living in a simulation. I feel like this movie was made for me because at the beginning of the movie, we get the classic Warner Brothers logo from the 70s. Yes, yes. That was my generation. I collected Warner clamshells, and I always saw that logo coming up. How do you on... think, hey, man, I, how do you think I watched movies, man? You forget. You're older than me, but I had the video store, so I rented Warner clamshells. So you saw that. that the, uh... old Kinney comp- the old Kinney Company. You know, you always saw the in Warner Brothers, a Kinney Company. And it would come towards you, and it would be that oval shape. I believe Saul Bass designed that logo for Warner yes, Brothers. Yes, he did. That. He did design that logo. Yeah. So, so this was this, and and then we we cut to something that is obviously very late seventies, very early eighties, and it looks like New York, but it is Gotham City. The way it's photographed, it's so amazing to me. The way it's photographed, I need. I I, I don't. Do you know offhand whether or not this was shot? Oh, dude, this it had to have been shot in New York. Them locations were too good. No, but but was it shot on film? Oh, you know what? That I don't know. I'm going to look it up quickly because this has such a film look to it. It almost looks it almost looks like faded film the way it's shot. I can do it a little bit quicker than you. Well, let me see. I'm already there. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Shot on. Well, it says a negative format. No, it was it was actually it was shot in 4K. Ah, it was shot in 4K. You are right. Uh, Aerie Alexa 65. But it was shot Castle on Band a, Prime on DNA. Raw and at 3.4K, blown up to 4.5 and then 5.85. 5.85 i guess they had imax did they have imax engagements for this movie yes they did oh so they had a 70 so they printed it from that to 70 millimeter for those showings so it was but it was shot that's that's amazing to me the look of this movie is incredible and i i incorporate um screenshots from the movie and and i picked out the best shots the cinematography is fantastic as well. I mean, like everything put together, this is totally a, a world that's been created. And if it's been created with computers, bravo. I can't believe they managed to do it because it, it integrates so well in with the action. It does. I mean, they made it feel like it's hard. It's very hard this day and age to make a movie that looks like it was done 40 years ago. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it's yeah. very hard this day and age. And they got the cars, they got the buses, they got the architecture and the color. There's a very murky brown, there's orange, there's green all throughout the film, and you can see it. And it was shot on, I also want to mention, it was shot on a, comparatively, this is a low budget movie compared to the. Oh yeah, 50, I think I remembered, I read this, it was 55 million, but then 120 for advertising. Yeah, and it made over a billion dollars. And it was rated yeah. R, too, on top of that. Yeah, first Although it's mainly R, just first it's, First ever R-rated film to become a billion-dollar grossing film. And it, 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 the R mainly comes from violence and language. It's not from anything else. There's no sex or anything. Like we said, I discussed with you last week, sex appears to have disappeared <laughs> yep. from film. But in a movie like this, you really don't want to see... Not, do you really no, want no, to, it's not necessary. Do you want to see Arthur Fleck having sex with Zazie Beetz? Uh, yes. <laughs> Mainly because of Zazie. Uh, she's, a, <laughs> she's a lovely woman, and a sex scene would have been really cool. But I understand that because of what we know, when we get to the spoilers of this whole thing, everything that's going on is, is not really um, happening as, it, as, as we're seeing it. It's kind of like that you know, perception thing that we were talking about. Yeah, you about. see, what I, I thought that my bi- the biggest problem I was going to have with this movie, with it being a Joaquin Phoenix film, I thought this movie was going to be so ambiguous. It was just going to be f- so full of ambiguity. Like, you weren't going to tell what was real, what was this, what was, you know, imaginary. Because this is Joaquin Phoenix we're talking about. Yeah, here. yeah. Okay. I, 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 I mean, uh, Joaquin, I, Joaquin Phoenix is, he's a, he's a brilliant actor. This, I felt, as far as a performance that wins him an Oscar, uh, they could have given it to somebody else. Because I feel like he, he does this kind of stuff in his sleep. Like, he could just act his way through. The, he could just sleep his way through this movie and still I, be interesting. I agree with you. I think they gave it to him as a way to say, hey, we should have given this to you for the master. But, you know, sorry, we fucked up. Yeah, yeah. So so here you go. So now we have Kinda to like... listen to a, a speech about cows getting raped for their milk. You know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's a, uh, oh, I mean, I'm sorry. I do not like him as a person. I I'm really not don't. a big fan of him as a person either. No, um, I mean, I mean, dude, he's not like he's not shady or anything like that that he's not like a wife beater or nothing like that it's just he's a fucking oddball 
I yeah, he's he's a weird. He's kind of like he's in the Crispin Glover school of being weird. Yeah, you know? only on the only difference is he's still getting work. Crispin Glover is doing his own shit. Crispin Glover would have been uh, pretty good in this too. I think <laughs> too old. Yeah, too old though. Too old for the part. Way but the thing old. is, I always see Crispin Glover in certain things. Like remember when Vince Vaughn played Norman Bates in the remake of Psycho? I said, Oh yeah, this dude, should have Crispin. gone to Crispin Glover. Crispin Glover. Yeah, I I could imagine him just saying it's like well. A boy's best friend is his mother. A boy's best friend. You know, and, and you know, trying to fight David Letterman and kicking him and things like that. I, I did want to point out there's a graphic novel, a brilliant graphic novel by Frank Miller called The Dark Knight Returns that kind of lifts uh, that uh, some of this is lifted from, especially the talk show. Now, a, a lot of people have talked about how this movie is very similar to The King of Comedy. And, and my, Taxi Driver. And Taxi. Well, you, you can throw Taxi Driver in for the mood, for the mood, definitely, because Taxi Driver is a mood. It's well, a then there was, but then there was that violent. one scene. They there was that scene they ripped off though, like where Arthur's looking at Zazie and he holds the you know, like the gun fingers to his head and like pretends to blow his head off. Yeah, that's a clear nod to the end of fucking Taxi Driver. Yeah, yeah, that's a clear nod, and it's also it also sets that up because uh, Taxi Driver. They always said the end of that movie. Fucking De Niro dies. Travis Bickle dies in that hotel, and the very end that you're seeing is just a hallucination. A hallucination. It, you mean the letter from Jodie? foster's parents right well, thanking because him that's for saving all hallucination her. and then at the end of the day when he's doing the gun thing to zazie beats it's a hallucination she's not even there there is that okay yeah and then you have the king of comedy another yes. movie with de niro scorsese obsessive kind of a lunatic personality who wants to be famous this kind of humanizes the character because he's not really the joker until the very end of the movie he is right Arthur he gets Fleck he just gets pushed he gets pushed he is he's a victim and he gets beaten up in the very first scene. In the very first scene, he's beaten up in an alley. He's left for dead, practically, in an alley. You think he has he has a mental disorder, uh, whatever it might be. He laughs at inappropriate times. So the thing about it is well, you Kamala find out Harris, gets... our soon-to-be vice president, is also like this. She laughs at inappropriate times. And I that has always worried me. Uh, you come to find out that he was abused and that he had head trauma. He, and that yes. his condition could have been brought on by the head trauma, by the abuse that he got from his stepfather. And even though it's Joaquin Phoenix, he creates a sympathetic character. Because you do feel bad for him. Yeah. And that at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You want to feel for this character. And you feel so bad for what he's going through about how this system has failed him. Yeah. About how yeah. Thomas Wayne's talking Absolutely. about how he's going to do all this good. There was, yet, there, oh, were, there were more than funding a, just I, got caught. There were more than a few um, occasions watching the movie where it really hit close because I, me and my mother, we were homeless for a time. We, we were neglected by the system uh, back when I was a teenager. And my mother was also a, a woman who was given to flights of fantasy and um, believing lots of things that weren't true. And let me, let me ask you, what do you think of this whole idea that Thomas Wayne is somehow the father of, this of this uh, neglected child i know that like there is some ambiguity ambiguity there but i honestly think i mean he is a day, prick no, he does seem like his, the kind yeah. of guy to his mother was mentally ill she fabricated this dream about how you know she you know she did work for the waynes but you could tell she had some she had some severe psychosis she implanted this idea that you know her kid was uh bruce wayne's illegitimate son even though Bruce Wayne was the one that helped her adopt a child. But that's but where do we where does that leave us in terms of the story? Because we're following this movie from Arthur's point of view. Therefore, shouldn't we as the audience believe that this is the actual truth, that this isn't the the the, the, the things that are illusions in this movie? And now we get to the spoiler that he never has this relationship with Zazie. Right. Right. And then but at least the movie wakes you up to the illusions. It spells well, how, it out. How much of what's the, not real? How, we know that that's an illusion because it's explicitly shown to us. How do we know? Right, because then when you watch not... it, when you watch it a second time, you can really see that it's an illusion. I get, yes, you can pick it apart. Definitely. I mean, they actually made a movie in 2019 that you can pick apart. That, right. that in and of itself is an incredible accomplishment. Because look at us, we're going on about this. We're going on about character motivation too. That really doesn't happen with movies being made these days. I don't know what what happened. Somebody hit Todd Phillips in the head with a bat, and he became a brilliant filmmaker. Yes, and I hope he makes another great movie. I really, I really like, yeah, dude. I, if he can do this, get out of comedy, man. I wrote him off because I thought he was just stupid comedy director, stupid gross out humor, right? And then he goes and makes this. 
I guess Bradley, Bradley must have had a good influence on him when he did uh, A Star is Born. He was like, wait a minute, let's make really thought provoking movies. He's like, what? Really? Can we do that? And it's like, OK, all right, let's make a thought provoking movie around a ridiculous subject, the Joker. But it turned out it, it did it did what no other movie could do. It humanized him, even though he does terrible things at the end. I, I don't know. What, what did you think? It's very cathartic. If you want if it's symbolist, he smothers his mother he murders her yep and then he goes and appears on the show well he kills he kills these two people that he worked with uh no he only killed he only kills the one. Oh, he, he killed the kills... one he did, he left the uh the little guy yeah he left the little person alone the little person alone always, we can't say midget said, anymore i'm sorry we can't see yeah, midget. little little person you said hey you were always nice to me you were always nice to me that's right he let he let him go it's revealed that uh Zaz- and that 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 scene where he's so terrified and he can't unlatch the lock he's like Arthur, can you open the door? Yes, yes. And then Arthur, without a beat, just gets up, opens the door, lets him go. <laughs> that's right. So, such, okay, that, such a great scene. That's 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 the that's the really great performance there. That's Joaquin's really great performance because this character becomes so consumed in his illusions that he walks right into this girl's apartment thinking that he has a relationship with her because he imagines having a relationship with her. And she is standing there mortified. And I was like, okay, I think I understand this. Now then one could also make you wonder, would it be his medication that's making him hallucinate? That, you know, another fucking you question. See, that's another question. It makes you think. May, what you See, what you don't know is maybe the medicine can bring down his psychosis, but at the same time, it can trigger... His hallucinatory uh, section of his brain. But then also, he, can halluc- he hallucinates. But then you never move, know. What about when we move the camera back to reveal that he's living in an insane world filled with insane people, and then he is just a voice in that chorus of insane people. Right. They I mean, he they, li- they he- begin. He 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 uh, becomes a pop culture hero to these people. They put masks on. They cheer him at the end of the movie, after he has killed. Robert De Niro, spoiler, sorry, live on television. Well, that uprising was already happening. It was the whole main thing was when he assassinates the three guys on the train. And they were all Thomas Wayne employees. But they were all assholes and they all deserve what they fucking got. So then it became kill the rich. Basically, yeah. And what were they? I mean, they were. And and it's so weird, too, because these are well dressed guys, right? High paying jobs and they're acting like a bunch of bullies. Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense. And hence why I said, hence the line I just said, they deserved what they fucking got. Like he says at the end, what do you get when you have a mentally ill loner who's been neglected by the by the system? You get what you fucking deserve. Yes, you get what you pay for. And because of that, if you get enough insanity going in a mob, it's going to look like the insane people are actually sane and everyone else that's against them is crazy. And this is the world we're living in right now. Well, unfortunately, I do. OK, if we're going to allude to what happened last week i'm not gonna get no political i'll just say this that wasn't no uprising that yeah, was just yeah, a yeah. bunch of that was just a bunch of redneck fuckholes i well you know what get, trying to get their one last gasp at nothing they didn't i mean well the thing about it is i don't think it was as as uh violent because the media was showing camera footage of just people wandering aimlessly they weren't exactly united as like a psycho mob out to destroy the capital it did not strike me as insurrection that's just the way i saw it no but no. other people the people if you're the enemy of those people and you look at those people as the other quote unquote they're going to look like insane rioters that's just the way it is that's just the way people look at things if they're if they're being constantly fed all this rhetoric by the media they're going to believe it if they don't use their own mind that's how that's what i think anyway i mean and this is a totally different case this was where you're already living in a world where the poor and the lower class are downtrodden and the rich don't give a shit about yeah yeah exactly exactly. and then they finally arthur was just that guy who said I've had enough. He was the like, and, he, he, and he wasn't even trying to be. He that wasn't. Guy yes, exactly, that. exactly. He, he wasn't, wasn't even, even trying. He's the reluctant martyr in this situation. He's a beacon that they all attach themselves to. When they arrest him for killing um, Robert De Niro's character, the riot breaks out. They top tip over the cop cars. There's rioting and fire in the streets. They let him out. They lift him up. You know, and he's their hero, and he becomes their hero. And that seems to be how it it ends. But uh, well, that is how it is. I mean, I don't think there's any ambiguity in the the final couple of minutes because what i'm led to believe is that 
Okay, dude, we all know who he is. He's Arthur Fleck. You just killed a guy on live TV, okay? Yeah. We know what you look like. You're going to get caught. I guarantee you he got caught after the riots. He got went to Arkham, and the only thing that you saw was that he killed that fucking psychiatrist wa- and walked away with bloody footprints. Bloody footprints walking to out. Say that, to say that, you know what, there is no cure for me. I am what I am. Yeah. And I'm going to stay this way. All right, I got a controversial opinion for you. Okay. Sure. Uh, this was way better than The Dark Knight. Way uh... better. I, by, by miles, this was much better. Joaquin is a much better Joker than Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger, I don't know what they were trying to do with that whole idea, mm. but I think this is the one that really nails it. Because, it get, like I said, you know how I enjoyed the killing joke and everything because it had that combination of really grisly stuff, but also... Very interesting stuff going on. This does that too. And I think it does it much more successfully than The Dark Knight. I think The Dark Knight was overrated. I think it was overhyped. I think they made a big deal about the fact that it was Heath Ledger's last movie. And I think they gave him that Oscar just because they felt bad. David, you (laughs) ignorant slut. I knew that you were going to say that. (laughs) How did I know you were going to say that? Oh, because you know that was fucking common. I'm sorry, dude. I love The Dark Knight. I'm a... Two things I am first and foremost in life. I'm a Superman fan and I'm a Batman fan. Marvel always takes third for me. That being said, Dark Knight was just the fucking movie. Save save for Christian Bale and his where's Harvey <laughs> and that. But I'm sorry. Heath Ledger was like my favorite Joker. No, and sorry. I'm sorry. He was. He was. Sorry, it's a matter sorry. of opinion. It's a matter of opinion. Matter of opinion. Well, John, you're still an ignorant slut. I'm going to say <laughs> my favorite my favorite part of the Dark Knight was actually Aaron Eckhart's um, Harvey Two-Face. Oh, his Two-Face? Yeah, yeah, he was a great Two-Face. He, he was, was he was an incredible Two-Face. He was much better than Tommy Lee Jones, much better than uh, Billy Dee. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's sad about that is I actually thanks to um going to a bar at the right place at the right time back in like January of 2008 there was a guy who was like working at the bar and he worked as a uh, production assistant on the Dark Knight when they were filming in Chicago and he said there's a big secret on this movie that they haven't brought out yet and I'm like are you gonna tell me he goes you got to promise you can't say nothing to nobody I'm like dude I I don't own a computer I didn't own a computer yet and I was like all right. He goes, Two Face. I'm like, oh. So I already, I already knew that Two Face was going to be in it. But unfortunately, I mean, Ledger and and his death got all the coverage. So right, it was kind but of. They like... were hiding. They were hiding Two Face though. Like they didn't want. Like I love the advertising. They like totally subverted you to just think this movie was going to be about Batman and the Joker, and it turned out, oh yeah, Two Face was in this too. When it comes to the Nolan movies, my favorite of them is probably the first one, Batman Begins. That one I really did like a lot. I did not like The Dark Knight as much as everybody else did, and I did not like The Dark Knight Rises. I'm not a big fan of Anne Hathaway. Dark Knight Rises, for me, was I liked it, but I didn't love it. Batman Begins, I love, and Dark Knight, I love a whole lot. Joker, I like a lot. I liked it a lot to put it on my 10 best list. I'm not going to say, oh, my God, I loved it to where I can watch it over and over again. It's just one of those movies where it's so depressing when you're done with it. Like you, It you, is it, very it, depressing, it, but again, it, again, it takes it out of you. We're it talking about this movie and it will be talked about. The uh, the thing that really irritated me was when all these freaking amateur psychologists were coming out saying that Joker was some representative of some beta male hysteria that goes on. I really didn't see it that way. I don't look no. at that. These movies are here to entertain us. That's what they should yeah. be doing, not not any of this other crap. Joaquin, I expected the worst out of him. I, I do not like him as a person, as an actor. To me, he's always been a little so-so. He completely made me change his mind about him, yeah. watching him in Joker. Like, I was he just actually, enamored. He, I, yeah. I feel like he disappeared into this movie. He did. Everybody, the, he, everybody, maybe with the exception of De Niro. De Niro is a little too big to disappear in the movies anymore. Everybody else disappears into this movie camera and into this frame and they're a living part of this whole painting whatever it is it's just it, it, i can't say enough about it and if you haven't oh we ruined it for you <laughs> but uh but it is this is a, an extraordinary piece of filmmaking it is and it for is. me uh, you know again controversially it may be my favorite ever adaptation of a comic book character in a movie, this movie, because it goes so beyond anything a comic book is capable of doing. It goes, in, say, it goes uh, into yeah. the human mind, which is its own kind of art form, if you will. I mean, it actually took a comic book character and made a real, just a real thought-provoking movie about it, you yeah. know? Yeah, 
And, and I, a, a lot of com. You see, that's where DC gets their shit right. That's where they should be doing it. This is where yeah. DC should be. They should get into the. They, they were always considered the dark, darker aspect of comic books and graphic novels and all that stuff. Marvel was very light. Marvel was very, you know, hey, Superman, uh, Spider-Man, the Hulk, you know, that kind of stuff. Iron Man. It was fantastic stories, you know. Whereas DC is more rooted in 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 the ground. You know, and this yeah, it's always in the ground. This is how they should do it, and I think I think they might be headed in the right direction if they can just look at the success of this movie and maybe hey, wait, maybe people want this. Hey, you, th- hey, you think that maybe when uh, Keanu Reeves gets done doing John Wick, we can reboot Constantine properly? Yeah, why not? It'll look hey, better that, at least. Yeah, that wasn't <laughs> a bad movie, by the way. Constantine was a good movie. I don't care what anybody says. Well, That's it suffered from movie. some visual effects issues. You well, know? that was. But I but think that we was, really that have. Was... I think we have this ability now to integrate these effects and make them look more realistic. I think we can really do that. Yeah, but at least at the same time, Joker didn't rely a lot on 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 heavy visuals. That was what was really good about it. A lot of it was in camera. Most of it was practical. It was very. Yeah, I mean, God, woo. I'm gonna think about seventy Scorsese. There it is, right there, watching it. All right. Well. We should wrap this up because I've got to have some cocoa. And also my throat's killing me. And it's not COVID <laughs> for crying in the beer. <laughs> I get into so many fights with people on, on social media. I know. Like the, they, like the second you tell people you're feeling shit, oh, God, you got the corona. No, I don't. I have a cold. Especially me. I mean, I get into fights with people online anyway, and they're like, you should get COVID. Just like in that scene in, in, in King of Comedy, this woman comes up to uh, – to Jerry Lewis and says, can I have your autograph? She's like, uh, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I have to go. And she screams, you should get cancer. <laughs> but uh, that's the king of comedy, which maybe we'll talk about at some point in the future. But next week, yeah, we got to talk about that next week. I believe we're doing some, a couple of Terry Gilliam movies. We're going to be doing fear and loathing in Las Vegas and Thailand, right? Oh yeah. I'm looking forward to that. That'll nudge, be fun. Nudge. Cause I, I, I got the Thailand uh, arrow Blu-ray, which is really awesome, but, uh, and it's still fresh in my head. So I need to watch fear and loathing again, just to get my bearings, uh, like share and subscribe. I remembered to say it and, uh, have a pleasant, uh, good night and a pleasant tomorrow. And hopefully yes, good. we'll still be a country, uh, by the time we record that. <laughs> yes. Let's hope so too. We got, we got as of, as of our countdown, we have two days left. Two days left until the end of all. All right. <laughs> Good night. All right. Good night.